it's my uh, pleasure and honor to uh, welcome you all to a discussion of the First Step Act, and in particular, the pattern risk assessment tool under the Act. And uh, I've got just an awesome panel here uh, to talk with you about that. Uh, to my immediate right, uh, some of you who were at the awards luncheon have already heard from uh, Chief Judge John Thunheim, who's the Chief Judge in the District of Minnesota. Um, and uh, to Judge Thunheim's immediate right is Matt Riedel, uh, former chair of the section, a retired uh, elected state attorney from Sheridan, Wyoming, who's now uh, an abysmal failure at retirement. <laughs> uh, to uh, Matt's right is Professor Steve Zeidman, who's a professor at uh, Cooney School of Law in, in Long Island, New York, and uh, has done a lot of uh, work in the area of risk assessment tools. And um, I should say that the Criminal Justice Section Act, uh, the Criminal Justice Section created a first step implementation task force to try to be on top of these issues. Uh, I'm the chair of that task force and Judge Thunheim, Mr., uh, uh, Matt and, and Professor Zeidman are members of our task force. Uh, but we're also honored to be joined today by Sakira Cook, um, who is the director of the Justice Reform Program at the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights here in Washington. And it's a long title, but the short answer is the Secure is in the trenches here actually lobbying and trying to get something good done and working on behalf of uh, a coalition of organizations uh, with a lot of pull. So uh, very happy to be here to talk about what we think is an important issue. And uh, what we're going to do is Matt, Matt's going to give us a little bit of an overview of what led to the First Step Act uh, and a little bit of an overview of the act. Uh, Judge Thunheim is going to talk a little bit about how the act is playing out in the courts because there are parts of the act that, that are happening now in the courts. And Judge Thunheim is going to talk a little bit about that and his district's unique approach to, to handling these cases. Steve Zeidman is then going to get us into the risk assessment tools and their challenges, talk a little bit about what's happened in New York and some some initial observations about the First Step Act tool. Secura is then going to talk in a little more detail about this, this tool. And, uh, and then Matt and I are going to kind of bat clean up with some additional thoughts about the tool, uh, as well as uh, Judge Thunheim. So it's going to be sort of an informal, interactive session. If you have questions, please raise your hand. Uh, you know, it's a small room. And uh, there's no reason that we can't take questions as we go if, if you have them. If we finish early, uh, we're starting a little late, but if we finish in time, we'll, we'll take some questions and answers at the end. So uh, with that, uh, I'll turn it over to Matt. Uh, how'd we get here? So, uh, and how we get out of here is going to be as, as important to me as how we, how we got here, because I just realized that what was supposed to be transferred to my tablet didn't get transferred. So I'm gonna do this from memory. And um, really the First Step Act is a response uh, long overdue to um, some of the criminal justice uh, policy that was created as a result of the crack cocaine crisis of the 70s and early 80s. And what happened uh, as a result of the crack cocaine uh, crisis was that uh, Congress and then subsequently state legislatures began to uh, develop more and more punitive uh, penalties for the use of uh, and delivery of crack cocaine. Um, and this is the era when we see development of a lot of mandatory minimum sentences uh, uh, making their way into uh, our legislation, our statutes. Um, it's also a period where there were more punitive sentences uh, to begin with. And really, the effect of uh, these sentences, uh, were, there were a couple of things about them that were very interesting, I think, that, uh, that need to be pointed out. The first thing that should be pointed out is the fact that they, they really had a racial impact. If you were in, if you were living in Teton County, Wyoming, in Jackson, where, uh, 
powder cocaine was plentiful at that time, uh, you were treated, you were subject to uh, less severe sentences than, um, than if you were a person of color, uh, for instance, in Newark, New Jersey, who was arrested in possession of uh, crack cocaine. Crack cocaine was more plentiful, it was cheaper, um, and the penalties were, uh, were made to be uh, draconian is, is a word that comes to, to mind. Um, so as a result of that, essentially we had uh, a significant portion of a generation that were sentenced to, um, uh, to federal penitentiaries and to our state pen penitentiaries for uh, offenses that meant that we had basically written off a significant portion of the generation at that time to a life in uh, incarceration. The um, First Step Act is really somewhat of a, um, it's really kind of a unicorn in this day and age. It, it's a unicorn because it's almost mythical in that it is a piece of legislation that was bipartisan in nature. Uh, it was passed into law uh, in 2018 and it was signed into law by the president in December of that year. Um, and it seeks to try to undo a lot of the, um, of the problems with the laws that are still on the books and that still provide for um, mandatory minimums. And what it really tries to do is it tries to develop a means of identifying people who are, um, who are incarcerated and who really deserve uh, a second chance. Um, and it looks at that by incentivizing uh, evidence-based programs that are designed to, to really um, uh, encourage and foster um, their ability to develop the, the tools necessary to be successful on the outside that make them people that are, um, that are very deserving of release from these punitive sentences that were imposed uh, upon them. Um, and it, the way, one of the ways that it does that is you have an opportunity if you were convicted uh, under these uh, statutes, uh, you have an opportunity to become engaged in uh, programming, as I mentioned, that's, that is evidence-based. Uh, and that will facilitate um, your success uh, by giving you employability skills uh, when you get out on the, uh, on the outside uh, that can address some of the issues that you might have as a result of uh, some of the, where you have um, certain risk factors that occurred, it gives you the opportunity to address those risk factors and to enhance what are called uh, dynamic uh, factors that make you more amenable to a successful life on the outside. And then it allows for you to receive greater credit, for instance, against um, uh, your sentence, I think it's up to 57 days uh, each year for time that you've, you've served. And it, uh, uh, it provides for the um, analysis of your particular situation 
using a risk assessment tool, and that'll be the focus of a considerable portion of our discussion today. And I think that has pretty much covered. So, and so as Matt indicated, a lot of what we're gonna talk about is this risk assessment tool component of the First Step Act, but the First Step Act also made retroactive the statutory changes that were enacted in the Fair Sentencing Act of, of, of 2010. So when the changes to the crack and powder penalties were, were changed from 100 to one ratio to 18 to one ratio, those changes were not made retroactive. So one of the things that the Fair Sentencing Act did was to make that retroactive and allow prisoners to petition Judge Thunheim for a reduction in their sentence. <clears throat> the other thing that it did is there's a provision in the law called com compassionate release or extraordinary and compelling circumstances where a prisoner who the classic was you know, terminally ill, but there are other circumstances that are considered extraordinary and compelling, could ask the Bureau of Prisons to petition the court for uh, early release so that they could die at home. Um, the Bureau of Prisons, however, was notoriously and historically uh, slow uh, in filing those petitions. In fact, so slow that most people died. Uh, and so one of the things the First Step Act did was allow, uh, you, you, you still ask the Bureau of Prisons to make that motion for you, but if within 30 days you don't have an answer or they say no, you can ask Judge Thunheim directly. Uh, to find extraordinary and compelling circumstances. Mm -hmm. So Judge, tell us a little bit about it in the District of Minnesota. How did you handle those two pieces of the ad? Uh, thank you, Jim. Um, I will say that uh, and the, the major impact on our court obviously has been the petitions for resentencing uh, based on the, uh, the Fair Sentencing Act amendments uh, years ago. Uh, some of us, for years, at least since the Fair Sentencing Act, had been using variance analysis to equalize crack cocaine and powder cocaine sentences just uh, through the power that we had to vary from a guideline range. But this uh, really has, has made a difference. What I did within about five days of the passage of the act, I sent a letter to the Sentencing Commission asking them to find all the individuals that we had sentenced from the District of Minnesota who possibly were eligible for a sentence reduction. I, I think we were the first district to ask. They came back with a list of, I believe, 17 who were eligible at least either immediately or very, very soon. We assigned a, a fed, assistant federal defender to each one of those individuals so they didn't have to do this themselves. We got the um, U.S. Attorney's Office involved and the Probation Office involved. And the culmination of that process was a letter from the Probation Office which detailed the things that we had to consider and whether to grant a sentence reduction, which includes you know, how they behaved in prison and some other aspects of their, their background. Um, and uh, part of this was having to issue an order to grant full access to pre-sentence reports and everything to uh, the new defense lawyer uh, and, uh, and making sure that the prosecutors had all the information as well. And the long and short of it was that we have now uh, reduced 15 sentences. Uh, we have seven more that have, been, that have been released. Eight of those were to time served and all 15 of those have been released from prison. And then we have seven more that are coming up relatively soon with, with release dates. Um, we also added a halfway house condition to each of these individuals because this is a rather abrupt uh, move out of prison that wasn't anticipated by anybody and we felt that we needed a little bit of time to acclimate them to the community. We've also uh, had a chance to participate in what's now called the home, Elderly Home Confinement Program. Uh, we have four of those cases now where we have individuals who are home serving out the rest of their sentence uh, with pretty close supervision by our probation office. I've had the opportunity to issue one order granting compassionate release, release which is to me was actually a very important day. I felt really good that day because so many, for so many years, We'd received petitions from prisoners, please let me go out early, or family, family members talking about infirmities in prison. And the Bureau of Prisons 
just was not was tone deaf on these issues and allowing people to uh, essentially live in a nursing home in a prison and die there was just cruel and we couldn't really do anything we had no authority to do anything about it uh, now we do and the first one I got, I, I wrote a lengthy order because I was a little concerned about getting reversed by the circuit. And they might find that my extraordinary and compelling circumstances weren't as so extraordinary and compelling. But I felt really good about that order. And I'm sure that uh, we'll have more to come because judges are receptive to, to this. And there's a lot of complaints among judges about defendants who are in prison serving out their lives and they're in bad shape. And when we visit prisons, you know, you go to... The, the medical wing of the prison and you see you know, 15 uh, prisoners who are getting kidney dialysis, for example. I mean, the, the costs are extraordinary and there's really no need for that. These are not dangerous people in the least. Um, and uh, uh, I've also had two instances now where I've had an individual charged with a drug-related crime subject to a mandatory minimum. And we were able to avoid the mandatory minimum under the new standard, which broadens the ability of an individual to qualify for uh, the, um, the provision that allows them to avoid a mandatory minimum because they had minimal criminal histories. Before, you had, a, had to have a criminal histories category, basically, of, of one. You had to be uh, someone who had really no criminal activity in your background. Now that's expanded a little bit, so we're able to avoid mandatory minimums, which is really important. It doesn't take you long as a judge to be really tired of mandatory minimums. They're, they're really very, very, very difficult for drug crimes and sex-related crimes and gun crimes. And now I just want to give you just a couple minutes of some statistics of what's happened nationally since the enactment of the First Step Act back last December. There have been one, as of September 30th, the latest statistics we have, there have been 1,987 offenders who have been resentenced under the First Step Act. Uh, these are all retroactive crack cocaine cases. Interestingly enough, the District of South Carolina, Judge Gurgle's district, leads the way with 132 uh, resentencings, uh, the most of any district throughout the country. Um, the, uh, nationally, the, uh, the, the person resentenced who's been in prison the longest went to prison in 1990. Uh, so that was probably someone with close to a life sentence who was able to be released under uh, this new provision. Um, so 80, about 85 percent of the petitions have been initiated by the by the offenders uh, under the under the act. Um, our cases would fall within that category, but of course we assigned lawyers to these individuals, so this would be done correctly and, and quickly. About nine percent have been initiated by the government, and about seven percent initiated by the court and 0% initiated by the Bureau of Prisons. The Bureau does have the authority to initiate uh, the uh, petitions for resentencing. It won't surprise anybody in this room that 91.2% of those uh, resentenced are African Americans, 91.2%. 3.8% .2 uh, are white and 4.2% are Hispanic. Interestingly enough, 2.4% of those resentenced are non-citizens uh, serving time in our prisons. The average age for the resentences has been 45. 66% uh, of those resentenced uh, are in criminal history category number six, so the, the highest risk uh, numbers. 57% uh, of those resentenced were convicted as career offenders, which of course carries the long, long sentences. Uh, and um, uh, the, the bottom line is that this is moving along pretty quickly. Uh, it is starting to correct the uh, long sentences of a long time ago that were that affected crack cocaine sellers, those convicted of that particular crime. You know, I think they should have been done a long time ago. The Fair Sentencing Act should have been uh, a a beacon for everybody to start resentencing, although it wasn't uh, made retroactive. Unfortunately, now it is. 
Uh, so it's been, uh, I think, long overdue. And so parts of the First Step Act are actually working pretty well. And for those of you who want to know what First Step Act stands for, you know, this is an acronym. It's not like the first step. It's called the Formerly Incarcerated Reenter Society Transformed Safely Transitioning Every Person Act. First Step Act. <laughs> that is a mouthful. That's about the longest uh, uh, acronym I've seen uh, in, in uh, uh, a system that has acronyms every single day. So anyway, that's a, a little bit of what's going on nationally. I'll have some comments later on the, uh, the risk yeah, assessment tool, which I think is a very, very important part of the act. Uh, Jamie, what, what, Judge, I have a question. Of, of those cases you, you identified, did, have, do all of those, have, have all of those resulted in a reduction of the sentence? Or do sometimes uh, the judges not do that? In Nationally, there aren't any statistics on which on how many uh, motions have been denied at this point in time. Uh, there have been uh, no motions denied in my district. Um, you know, the amount of the sentence reduction varies uh, depending on the uh, individual situation. Uh, but to, for those in my district who were sentenced to time served got a significant amount off of their time, off of their sentence. The national statistic as to how much of a sentence break this has caused is at 26.4%. So 26.4% of an individual sentence on the average nationally is what the reductions have included. I, I just have to pause to say how much I appreciate hearing Judge Tunheim the way that you approach this. Mm -hmm. uh, I just have to say that. I mean, to be so proactive, to identify the people, to, to make it happen. Uh, I will say not every district is like that. <laughs> not every judge is like Judge Tuna. Uh I will also say the federal defenders have just done a heck of a job here. They are handling most of these cases. They are allowed to file these things for their clients. Now, unfortunately, Sandy, to your question, there are two districts where there is no federal defender. Uh, the Eastern District of Kentucky and the Southern District of Georgia has no federal defender. So my understanding is things are handled quite differently there. Uh, an example would be, I think I've heard quite a few cases in the Eastern District of Kentucky where prisoners will write the court asking for the appointment of counsel. The court will construe that as the motion itself, deny the motion, and then deny the request for counsel as moved. Um, so there are significant challenges here in different parts of the country. The other thing is that the law is really quite ambiguous. It says that, um, well, we don't think it's ambiguous, but the Department of Justice does. Um, it speaks in terms of you are entitled to resentencing if you were sentenced under a covered offense, which is defined to be an offense where the penalties have been changed. Well, the way the penalties were changed was to, to um, increase the amount of crack that you would have had to have in order to trigger the mandatory minimum. So what would have happened back in the day, they would have charged in the indictment the minimum amount of crack necessary to trigger the mandatory minimum. And then the plea agreement might contain a stipulation to a greater quantity. So what do you do in a case where uh, the, the, the stipulated facts establish a quantity that would still trigger the mandatory minimum today? Uh, well, we, we, we've been filing those cases, and our argument is it's still a covered offense. And most of the courts have ruled, that's right. And it may be that it's something of a windfall, but that's what the law says. Um, so there's an article today in the Washington Post that happens the timing. I don't know if any of you all can see this. Uh, this is my client, Gregory Allen, at the White House celebrating with Donald Trump. Um, <laughs> At the time he was celebrating with Mr. Trump, the Department of Justice had an appeal pending to put him back in prison. Um, the next morning I called the Department of Justice, let's just say their enthusiasm for their appeal did not survive their review of YouTube. Um, but one can question their dedication, I guess, to the spirit of this law. So there's quite a bit of litigation there. It did do other things, as Judge Tunai mentioned. Uh, it, it, it made it harder for them to stack 924Cs. Um, it also lowered the mandatory minimums for 851s, the habitual offender uh, provision. Um, so um, uh, there's a lot more work to be done, but what a, what a feeling of encouragement. Uh, I don't know, I've said this before, no one has yet corrected me. That 2010 law that lowered the penalties for crack cocaine, I believe is the first time in the history of this republic, 
in which the Congress has ever lowered the penalty for a crime. They've made things that were illegal legal. They've never looked at a crime and said, the penalty for that's too high, we're going to lower it. And that's what we're doing now, and it's been done several times since then. So we are in, in an age of encouragement, notwithstanding these challenges. Uh, but that takes us to really the heart of the First Step Act, the most sweeping part of its reform, which is the risk and needs assessment tool or system that's going to govern who gets out of prison when. Um, so let me turn then to Professor Zeidman to talk a little bit about risk assessment tools in general and then whatever you want to say about it. Sure. Thanks, Jim. Um, yeah, I was asked to sort of widen the lens and talk about risk assessment tools generally. And as most of you probably know, they've been around for a while, but they are now springing up all over the country and in different contexts. They're at the front end with bail. They're at the back end with sentencing and parole. They are, they, there is, I think it can only be described as a cottage industry. There is millions and millions of money being spent by government agencies and being earned by just a handful of companies. So I was thinking, I hope, I don't know if anyone here is from North Point or just, <laughs> which is doing a lot of wonderful things, but it's interesting. It just seems to be the same handful of companies that are, when you dig a little deeper, um, millions upon millions of dollars being spent. And while the, um, the risk assessment tool has already, the train has left the station or the for Matt, the horse has left the barn. Um, I, I think it is worth noting that um, a lot of people are bristling uh, and, and are very uncomfortable with this particular movement. And you, I heard someone uh, put it, I think, best. They just said the idea of reducing a human being to an algorithm is very troubling to me. Uh, the idea that we take so-called machine-based learning in the complex area of criminal justice and make decisions about whether someone is going to go home or stay in pending the, uh, their criminal case. Troubling to a lot of people. Let me just give you one very concrete example that was brought to my attention the other day. So there are a lot of jurisdictions on the bail determination, right? Before you see a judge, you're interviewed by a human being. And they look at your record, and that's part of it, prior arrests. They ask about how long have you lived here? Oh, I see that you're not working. Why not? And you can explain it and then they prepare a recommendation to the court. So the suggestion now is we don't even need that personal interview. Just somebody can enter data into a machine, spit out a number, and then what the judge will get for the bail determination is you know, 19 or 24, and there'll be some chart about what that number actually means. So that's just sort of the, the sort of macro concerns. Let me also just suggest this for those of you who are thinking about risk assessments in any context. Uh, and I think this matters greatly with pattern, with uh, the first step back. What is the purpose of the tool? What is it trying to achieve? Is it meant to be advisory? Is it meant to be presumptive? In which case, if it's not followed, there has to be an explanation. Is it meant to be mandatory? Is there a macro purpose? such as reducing a jail or prison population? Or is the purpose just to make decisions more fair and uniform? And on that particular note, I just want to quote from the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which, as some of you may know, is an organization really looking very deeply into these tools. And it's a wonderful line. It's, no matter how often advocates refer to them as science or evidence-based, they are not magical fairness machines. And I think that's true, and we tend to gloss over this. I think most jurisdictions are embracing this as a way of seeking uniformity and fairness without taking a careful look. So um, let me just, in two minutes, Jim, if I can, about New York. Yeah. Um, this, speaking of, of timing, it's wonderful timing. New York is about, in the next couple of weeks, to unveil a brand new risk assessment instrument um, concerning bail. And its stated purpose, this is what's being circulated right now, a science-based tool. There you go, and from my perspective, when they start with that, it almost means like you can't argue against it, right? It's science, it's evidence-based, designed to predict a defendant's likelihood of appearing at all court dates and intended to inform the judge's release decision. So that word inform is telling, right? It's advisory, it's not presumptive, it's not mandatory, but here's, here's how it works. I'll try and do this shorthand because I don't know if everyone's familiar with it, there are a set of factors, such as uh, community ties, how long at your residence, prior convictions, a whole bunch of factors that then yield a numerical score. 
and based on that numerical score, you're placed in one of a few places. Recommended for release on your own recognizance, uh, another category, something like the judge should consider a number of options, or another category saying not recommended. And what it, there are so many different pieces that are challenging, again, with the best of intentions, and I don't question the intentions, but let me just mention a couple, and then I'll turn it over to Ms. Cook, who knows a lot more about these than I do. Um, if it is science-based, then it has to be transparent. Uh, the, the data has to be provided to outside researchers, and I think even more importantly, it has to be evaluated by independent scientific researchers, not by the government agency that wants to use it, and not by the company or the private vendor that rolled it out. Uh, that hasn't happened yet. The factors, as has been mentioned, the factors, no matter how you pull them apart, there's, a, there's, some, there's some racial bias in there. And, and we can point to a variety of them. Yeah, I'm sorry. Well, that's exactly the question that I was going to ask. I've done a lot of work. My name is Jay Lewis, but I've done a lot of work on bail reform yeah. in Massachusetts and also ABA resolutions, uh, uh, specifically uh, a resolution to revisit the utility of juvenile bail and whether or not there should be uh, an empirical tool in lieu, uh, as well as a judicial determination of the ability to pay. Uh, but these are the big questions. Are the factors that are used in these tools empirically validated independently, and are they race neutral? So just as an example of this, the Massachusetts system, we have this thing called uh, JPAS, Juvenile Probation Assessment, Asse Assessment uh, Systemic Tool. Uh, and of the and in the JPAS, they took the enumerated factors of the Massachusetts bail statute, and those enumerated factors, like in a lot of states, just were put together by a lot of well-intended people appointed to a Blue Ribbon Committee. Mm -hmm. It turned out that of the, I think, the, the, uh, the 16 enumerated factors, there may be 14, only five were, empiric were empirically validated and race neutral. And so that's the big concern. Uh, that a lot of people have, practitioners I know, also judges who've got to make a use that to inform their decision. Well, in fact, Judge, um, one of the problems with the risk assessment tools is that they may try to correct for some of those patent uh, areas of discrimination, for instance, uh, uh, race, gender, that sort of thing. But in doing so, they may substitute uh, things that are latent, uh, latently discriminatory. For example, they may decide to use zip codes. Mm -hmm. Well, there are going to be certain areas, certain zip codes, where it's predominantly uh, race yeah, it's, racial. It's not race neutral. Right. <laughs> it's, a, it's not gender neutral necessarily. It isn't. Correct. It isn't going to be uh, something that would be uh, neutral in terms of income for the area. Steve, Steve, did you get finished talking about the New York? Yeah, what, one other piece I wanted to mention, and on this, you know, the, the question is, are there weighted correctives? Are there ways to try and fix what is just inherent? And I guess my frustration is when people who are proponents, advocates, don't acknowledge exactly what you said, Judge that these are, these are baked in, they're there, it's just what are we gonna do about it as opposed to pretending they don't exist. I'll give you one more example in New York. As this was being rolled out, we heard that the prior instrument that had been used in New York for years was profoundly racially disparate, but this one was only 6%. That's what they said, only 6%. You say it should be 0%, especially in a jurisdiction like New York City with 250,000 arrests a year, you're talking 15,000 people. But the third <laughs> factor, the third thing I hope everybody will think about, regardless of the context, and this gets to the First Step Act as well, directly, is the so-called cut point. And, and this, you just have to take a minute to wrap your head around this. So you get that numerical score. And let me, let me pretend I'm an advocate for a moment for these instruments. It's numbers, it's numerical, it's fair, it's subjective. Okay, but what do we do with that number? So let's say on a, on a, a bail determination, you got 25 points, that's the maximum. So I determine you are gonna be, we're gonna recommend you be released. What if you got 21? What if you got 20? Where do I put the cutoff point? I hope people are with me. That's, the, the, that's politics and policy, that's not math. That's not science. That's about tolerance of risk. 
where I put this. And I think that comes into play in the first, the first step back risk assessment tool. I will defer to the others on the panel, but what I had heard is already over 50% of the federal prisoners would be classified as medium or high risk. Yeah, let me, let me tease Shakira by just giving yeah. you an overview of what the risk and needs assessment tool in the first step back is supposed to do. Um, it is supposed to be a two different things, a risk assessment tool. What is the, how do we assess this prisoner's risk of recidivism in a needs assessment tool? What needs could we meet for this prisoner that would lower that risk of recidivism? So this tool is, in theory, going to do both these things. And the risk piece of it is supposed to divide every federal prisoner into one of four categories of risk, minimal, low, medium, and high. Those prisoners who are in, and, and as they go through programming, they can go down in risk category. So a high can theoretically become a medium, and then a, a low, and then a minimal through programming. Prisoners who are in the lower two categories, minimal or low risk, are entitled to 15 days of gain time credit for every 30 days that they are enrolled in productive activities or needs-based program. Think about that. Mm -hmm. Half off, plus your 54 days a year of good time credit. So we don't know what productive activities means. <laughs> the Bureau of Prisons hasn't told us that yet. In theory, every prisoner has a job. So in theory, maybe everybody's engaged in productive activities all the time. So half the prisoners will get out after half the time. The people at the top half will not earn game time credits. Their incentive <coughs> to participate in these programs is to get down into yeah. a lower category. How do they pick those three cut points? They, 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 they take, the, they take this, this tool and they divide everybody into a continuum and they have to draw three lines on the page. The first line was drawn down the middle at the halfway point. They just decided, we're going to decide that if you're below average risk, compared to everybody else, you're low and medium. Now, I was encouraged by that because I was a little afraid they might draw that line where only 5% of the people could get any benefit. So on the one hand, it's great. Half the people can get the benefit. On the other hand, you look at it and you think, we can never do any better. No matter how good we get, half the people are still going to be middle and, and high risk, by definition. They did the same thing for men and women, but they did them differently or separately. So. By definition, women's risks of recidivism are lower. So half the women have to be medium or high risk. So a medium risk woman has a significantly lower percentage or rate of recidivism than a low risk male. But the low risk male is going to get the credits, the medium risk woman is not. Then they took the other two lines and between medium and high on the one hand, between minimal and low on the other hand, and they drew those based on percentages. So if it's 25% or less, you're minimal, 25 to 50, you know, and then if you're 80% or higher, it's high. So there were apparently a dozen different cut point mechanisms they considered. They picked these. We don't know what the others are. Um, but as they explained this, and I, this is my, the DOJ, by the way, released this, a, a report describing the tool on July the 18th. None of us have seen the tool itself. It's still a secret. But there is a report that describes the tool, and it contains this statement, which I think is a beauty. A risk and needs assessment tool cannot achieve racial fairness by more than one definition of racial fairness at the same time. Well. So basically, everybody's going to think it's racist depending on your perspective. Um, you can't achieve racial fairness by more than one definition of fairness at a time. So the math works the way they've done it. As I'm telling you, they hired these PhDs, Grant Dewey and Zach Hamilton. These guys are the real thing to do this tool. And they ran the numbers, and they ran the numbers right, based on hundreds of thousands of tests from VCs. The problem is that some of the factors are things like, have you been arrested? And how many times? And we know that police practices in community color, in communities of color are different. So I have a feeling Ms. Cook has some things to say about that. I'll let you go. <laughs> 
Uh, thanks. Um, and thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks for, uh, to the ABA for inviting me. Can people hear me? Do I need this uh, mic? Okay. Oh, you, I do need the mic. Okay. Sorry. The camera lady's like, no, use it. Um, so uh, I work for the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. We're a coalition of about 200 national organizations. And the Leadership Conference, uh, um, and it's great to hear uh, uh, the judge's description of how uh, the front end changes to the First Step Act. And I want to make that distinction, right? There were changes that affect the front end of the system, which are sentencing related changes and changes that re are related to people who are currently incarcerated. And that's the risk assessment system, right? And those are two very distinct um, reforms. And there was a lot of contention around those two very distinct reforms um, and the pieces that the leadership conference and our coalition partners were primarily concerned about were those that the judge described, were the changes to uh, 924C, to um, safety valve, to the uh, habitual offender provisions, um, to the elderly release program. It was because we know that the federal incarceration, um, excuse me, federal population is so high and almost half of those people are there for drug offenses that we had to focus on addressing mandatory minimums. That was gonna be the mechanism for us to get more fairness in the system. That's what we were fighting for. And quite frankly, just to be honest, most people don't know this, the White House and everybody else who supported the bill before it came out of the House didn't care about those things. They're touting them now, they're praising them, having people come who've been released on them. But that was not their concern. They were concerned with the piece of the bill that actually has the most problems, <laughs> the piece of the bill, which is the risk assessment system. That was the thing that they said, to your point about goal, it was their goal to adopt this risk and needs assessment system to release more people. They were saying, oh, we're putting this in place so we can get more people out of the system. And we were like, mm, changing sentences is the mechanism by which you stop people from going in and making those sentences, those changes retroactive, getting people out. Right. Getting people who are serving 10, 15, 20 life for drug offenses primarily out of the federal system. That's the way we get population reductions. That's how we got it in 2010. That's how we got it under the Obama administration when they made some very significant changes to their charging decision policy by not charging quantity at, at, at the time and, and allowing judges more flexibility because quantities were not tied to the person's charges. That's how we got the population reductions that we have today. That's where the trend has been going down. So. Think about that context, right? That that the front end pieces that we push for, that we continue to need, the end of mandatory minimums, those are the things that actually will get us the real numbers in reductions in population. So now we get to this uh, tool that we oppose um, at the at the um, adoption of this bill. We were very concerned for a number of reasons. One, we didn't think the Bureau of Prisons or the Department of Justice had the expertise or the willpower, the desire, to actually adopt and implement and develop a tool that would meet the needs that have been described by this panel, that would address racial bias, that would actually be transparent, that would actually uh, allow the most people to be able to be released and to benefit from um, these earned time credits that were being pr provided through this mechanism. Um, and we have been born, I mean, our, our concerns have sort of been come to fruition with the adoption and, and release of Pattern. Pattern um, is based on Bravo R. And Bravo R, I mean, if you Google it, all that comes up is one page that's a, like a very general description of what it is. That's not transparent. If you base a tool, a new tool, on a old system and you don't release the data related to that old system or the, or the numbers or how that old system was, was built and what the, what the outcomes of that old system are, then you're not creating a transparent system. You're not creating something that is transparent or, it, or necessarily can be independently validated either. So that was one of our main concerns, right? We don't know about Bravo R. We think that Bravo R was the Bureau of Prisons mechanism for determining how people were going to be housed, which is a very different uh, thing, right? They, when you, once you go into the prison system, you, you get an interview and they look at your, your criminal history and they look at um, your sentence and your time, et cetera, and they say, okay, you should be classified as high, high, you know, based on the, the facility, you should go to a high facility, a medium facility, a low facility. That's what we believe Robert R was used for initially, 
not to identify criminogenic needs that can then be matched, criminogenic, excuse me, risk, that can then be matched with needs to help someone be able to reduce the risk of recidivism, because that's the goal of the system. That's not actually, in our opinion, what will happen if this ever gets rolled out, and it's supposed to be rolled out very soon, and gets applied to currently incarcerated individuals. So that was one, the one point. We talked a, a little bit about, so there's no transparency, and in our opinion, the tool has not been independently validated. So that's a huge issue. Risk, uh, race. The elephant in the room, right? <laughs> um, there is no tool that I have seen that will adequately adjust for race, for, for the inherent bias that is in the criminal justice system. And that's the data. That's because every tool is trained on a set of data, a set of data that that tool designer or that um, community or that you know uh, city council decides that they're gonna use that is historical data, historical data of arrest or historical data of people's failure to appear, or historical data of um, conviction, right? That historical data forms the foundation of every tool that I've ever seen. And then, and so because of that, and we know that data is historically biased against certain communities, on top of that, deciding which factors, static, things that can't be changed, your age, your zip code, um, your, you know, criminal history, right? Static factors, and then dynamic factors, which are things that you can change over time, right? If you were to, to have the supports. Most tools weigh the static factors more heavily, and Pattern does exactly the same thing. Pattern says it, it has greater use of dynamic factors than Bravo R was, but the greater use doesn't actually matter because it doesn't offset the weight of the static factors, right? To the, to the point that if you were to say, hey, we're gonna have 20 factors that we consider, right? 10 of them are gonna be static, 10 are gonna be dynamic. That's, that could seem fair, right? But then if you assign more weight to the static factors to say that if you have two convictions, that gives you 10 points in the scale, but and then if I get a static factor, a dynamic factor is that I uh, attain education or something like that, right? But that only gives me five points. I'm still not going to end up being able to overcome the weight of the static factor in the long run. And it might put me in a position to be classified as a higher risk person or a medium risk person. And then finally, static factors you cannot change dynamic factors, you can, but dynamic factors are very difficult to change in a prison environment, right? <laughs> we don't have the level of rehabilitative services in the Federal Bureau of Prisons that is necessary for this tool to actually work and make sense for people, right? In order for the dynamic factors that they've increased to actually be mechanisms to allow people to like move from high to medium in any meaningful way, they would have to vastly expand the numbers of programs that they offer today. And they don't. They offer about 117 programs, but they are not across every facility. Every facility does not have the same level of programming, whether it's educational programming or work-related programming or social-emotional programming to help an individuals who identify with certain criminogenic risks to have the needs that match that to be able to successfully move through the system. So those are the, some of the, the failings of the development of pattern that will, in our opinion, ensure that certain people who will automatically be low and medium because they might not have as much criminal history um, and they might have education and they might have some of the other, other things that lower their risk will get out. And those who are high and medium, no matter their best efforts, will never be able to earn this 57 days in order to go to a halfway house early. Now, it doesn't take time off the sentence. It really just moves you to the halfway house a little bit earlier, which is better for some people than staying incarcerated. And so these are the critical questions and issues that we've raised both with the Department of Justice and the committee. There was an independent review committee that was established that is managed by the Hudson Institute. Um, to ensure that the department was creating a tool that was transparent, that was statistically validated properly, um, and that would meet the, the, the goals of the First Step Act and would actually meet congressional intent. Um, and, and that hasn't happened. Um, and we have called on Congress, there was a hearing a couple of weeks ago, and at the end of, 
in October, excuse me, uh, a review of the First Step Act where these very critical questions came up. Um, and quite frankly, the government's responses were, were, were lacking <laughs> with respect to these issues, these critical issues. And the report that talks about racial bias specifically says, oh, well, you know, there's no statistical bias in, in, in the tool. Yeah, but that doesn't account for um, the inherent bias. It doesn't account for false positives that might happen with the uh, advent of a tool. And the last thing I'll say is we, we keep saying tool because we're being nice. It's not a tool. There's actually no algorithm that was developed that I saw. It literally, and Jim, you correct me if I'm wrong, in the report, it's literally a sheet. Like you can, I could... You, all of you actually could today, maybe if you have a client, a hypothetical client, you could go and determine whether your client would be able to get out under this tool based on the, the report that they sent because it's just tallying numbers. It's basically saying if you have this much criminal history, you get this many points. If you have this much uh, education, you get this many points. That is basically what it is. So that's not really a, a, a tool. And the last thing I think that, D, uh, that my colleague here said about the policy choices that we make around the cut points, it's a policy choice. We're deciding that 25% of the people should be, that means you're high if you're 25. I could say, if that actually means that they, that you know um, that you know that's that's a seventy five percent less. But what what if we had a higher cut point to say it's actually ten percent of the population is a high risk person or fifteen percent? Right? They'll, those are choices that people are making, not necessarily based on science and based on historical factors that we can't even interrogate because we don't have the data sets. So that, those are some of our, <laughs> there's a few of uh, the problems with pattern. Well, I have more to add, but I want to let Matt and the judge weigh in. Matt, some other thoughts? And well, about yeah, just piggybacking on some of the issues that have come up. As far as, as um, this issue of transparency, that's very real. It's a very real problem. And the problem is that nobody can really um, give this process under the best of circumstances the kind of transparency that we're talking about. Uh, Steve brought up the, um, the idea that we need to have 100% uh, no error rate. The problem with that is as soon as somebody tells you that any kind of tool is a, based in some way in science mm -hmm. or math, mm -hmm. um, there is no 0% for error rate. There's mm -hmm. always going to be an, some kind of error rate. Um, that's the hallmark of science. They don't deal with certainty in science. They deal with uncertainty in science. Um, but when they say that there's no statistical bias because this is mathematical, um, they're selling you snake oil because the, re the reality of it is that there is always bias, even in statistics. Uh, we talked about some of the sources of that bias when we talked about issues of race and gender and how they, they pull the, the numbers. Um, that's going to create bias by its, itself. Now, there is a way that you can valid, validate this. This kind of, of device is known as a black box device because information goes into the black box, it spits out a result, but in point of fact, nobody can tell you how the device came to the conclusion that it came to. Nobody can do it, including the developers, no matter how bright they are. The more, uh, the more detailed the variables become, the more difficult it is for anybody to know how the decision is actually being made. So how would you validate that kind of device? The way that you validate a black box device is that you, what you do is you do uh, measurements of uh, positive um, 
what's the, what you're looking for is you are really looking for uh, the negative uh, error rate and the positive error rate. The negative error rate would be how many times does it say someone isn't going to uh, violate bail or reoffend, and how many times is that wrong? How many times did they did they wrongly predict the outcome? Positive error rate is how many times does it say a person is going to uh, is going to reoffend? or flee in the case of bail? And how many times does it turn out that they don't reoffend? And you look at both of those two issues. Now, it's going to give you uh, an error. It's going to explain how frequently are these predictions wrong? And that's important for judges, defense counsel, prosecutors to have because it tells, it tells, it informs how much reliance we can place on the tool and how much we have to allow our human judgment to decide whether or not the, the risk is such that we feel comfortable making certain decisions. Um, that's, that's really a part of it. And to say that, you, one thing that you really need to understand about algorithms and the models that they produce is that algorithms do not do well in issues of context. And context in these cases is always extremely important. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, the Legal Aid of Arkansas sued the Arkansas Department of Health. Um, and what had happened was that they had um, the Department of Health had a program for Medicaid patients. The program was designed so that uh, they would determine how much assistance a Medicaid patient may need in their home uh, over the course of a week in order, to, uh, in order to live on their own. And they, they had been doing this for a number of years some, someone developed an algorithm to determine how much time they needed to have each week. Now, this was motivated not out of concerns about the welfare of the patient, but it was really a monetary thing. Uh, it was based upon what they perceived as being uh, a desire to reduce the number, uh, the amount of uh, of assistance that people were receiving. And so they sent people around who did a questionnaire of over 280 questions. 60 of those questions had to do with the algorithm. The other 220 were contextual factors, but the contextual factors don't come into play in the algorithm. Um, and so as a result, people began complaining to the Legal Aid Society of Arkansas about how they had illnesses that were not getting better. For instance, quadriplegia, MS, uh, those sorts of things. And yet their, their time was getting cut. And Legal Aid looked into it and they found that there were some problems inherent in the questionnaire itself. For instance, um, the questioner uh, conducting the survey correctly noted that patients did, a, a patient did not have foot problems because the patient had had both feet amputated <laughs> as a result of diabetes. And this had happened years earlier. And while the patient did not suffer from corns, bunions, hammer toes, or other conditions that might affect mobility their, or their level of pain, the loss of their feet to diabetes certainly affected their mobility. And that's the kind of context that we're talking about. Um, and there are biases. We've talked already about how these are aimed at achieving different goals. 
uh, one of the, the most um, utilized risk assessment tools is called Compass. Mm -hmm. And Compass was initially designed at the request of the state of California to reduce prison populations as a budget saving mechanism. Uh, Wyoming, my state, is currently looking at a proposal from Department of Corrections to adopt a, a similar, well, it, it is the Compass tool. Don't do it, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and so, you know, that's, that's where it's, it's coming from. They have biases. Mm -hmm. And uh, the idea that they don't have biases is a fairy tale. Jim, I forgot to mention two things about um, uh, pattern that I think also are important um, to note. At the <clears throat> uh, during the legislative process and the negotiations around the bill, one thing was actually decided beforehand. A cut point was actually decided beforehand. <laughs> the draft, the, the uh, members of Congress decided to exclude almost half of the population of people in currently incarcerated from even participating in this program to begin with, based on their offenses. Well, I don't well, think it's, for, for it's not half. It, it, well, it's, it's not half. It's a long, it's a long list of, of, it's about 30 something thousand people, I think it was, of 30 or 40,000 people, not half, 30, 30 or 45,000 people. But a significant portion of the population uh, was already excluded based on their offense, right? Based on the type of offense. And the, the idea was that these are the types of offenses that are violent, offensive. Right? These are the types of offenses that are violent offenses. Now, pattern is supposed to judge violent recidivism, right? So if you've already excluded the majority of people who had, based on their offense alone, who supposedly had a violent offense, and then you're adopting a risk assessment system that's supposed to judge violent recidivism, I mean, it just sort of doesn't uh, measure up to the forethought that you supposedly with no had definition of with no so. definition of violent recidivism. So no like, violent recidivism either. Sounds like, sounds like an oxymoron. It sounds like an oxymoron. Mm -hmm. I mean, so that was one, I think, an important point that both, this is supposed to judge violent recidivism with no de definition of violent recidivism. And supposedly we've already excluded a whole swath of people who yeah. based on their offense are violent, supposedly. Judge Tunheim, your thoughts yeah. about pattern? <laughs> Well, as a judge and as judges in this country, we deal with risk every day. I mean, that's a common denominator of all of our jobs. If we are judges in a criminal court or a judge in juvenile court or a judge that really has to, to worry about risk, we've got uh, a system that we developed in Minnesota because there wasn't anything anywhere else for assessing the risk of recidivism for individuals convicted of terrorist crimes. Uh, it actually is working fairly well. It's based on developments in uh, both in Germany and UK and to a lesser extent on five or six other countries that have tried to assess the risk of people convicted of these uh, violent terrorism crimes. And if we can figure out how to do that, which is working so far, I would think that uh, we could be uh, a little bit more careful with, with pattern. You know, um, I will tell you that if I'm not comfortable with a tool or how it's been developed, I'm going to be less likely to rely on it. So it really is not a very good idea to develop a tool that people are uncomfortable with, that it has not been tested independently, that, is not, uh, that flaws in it have not been clearly pointed out. Um, you know, and the alternative, of course, is instinct. And I'd much rather rely on a tool that is uh, evidence-based and is tested independently and is thoroughly vetted uh, than my instinct, even though I think my instinct is pretty good. Um, one other point I want to make that before I uh, uh, surrender the microphone, and that is on the mandatory minimum changes, which are good, uh, although not retroactive, um, the, the problem is that sentencing guidelines are tied to mandatory minimums. And there's been no change in the guidelines. Why? There's no sentencing commission right now. The appointments have not been made. There's no quorum for a sentencing commission to make decisions. So the guidelines have not been adjusted. 
There's no idea when this will occur. We got no new guidelines manual this year, as all of you probably know. And uh, I'm not sure about, well, we're getting close to when next year's manual should be coming out. And it doesn't look like it's going to. So, you know, there's some other problems with the system catching up with some of the changes in first step. I wanted to just cover the process a little bit so you all will know what has been happening and what is going, going to be happening, and then, and then we'll take some questions. I, the, the DOJ um, had a listening session before they released this tool, and we were invited to go uh, to that listening session, and I went, and um, there wasn't really much that I could say at that point because they hadn't done anything yet, so I basically asked questions. They then released this um, report about the tool and had another series of listening sessions. And I will tell you that when we got the, the report about the tool, again, really what we mostly had were questions. It's very hard to give feedback unless you understand what it is you're giving feedback about. And so the ABA put together a series of questions, and I want to recognize Chris Slobogan, who's not here, but Chris is a professor at Vanderbilt Law School who has devoted an incredible amount of time to our task force and a lot of our expertise on this issue. And he helped us draft a letter that was sent by the president of the ABA, Judy Perry Martinez, to the Department of Justice, to the Attorney General, asking a series of questions. That letter is in your materials for this conference. We've not gotten any response to it. Um, and then we go to the listening session. Chris and I went to the listening session, and at the listening session, they just listened. You get five minutes, you say what you want to say, and then they say thank you, and walk out. And so we don't know what they're doing, and we want the data that underlies the tool so that other academics can look at what they've done and evaluate it. What I told them was, we have shown the world how to lead in imprisonment. As a country, we've demonstrated to the world, here's how you can lock up more people than anyone. How about if we teach the world how to, how to reverse that? What if we were to develop the best tool to really identify risk of recidivism and needs? The best way to do that would be to make it public so that Professor Dillmeyer or and, and any professor can look at the data and study it and talk about it. So at this hearing, there was, uh, again, a request for the tool itself, because we don't have the tool. You can make your guesses about what the tool might say, but we don't have the tool itself. And we're waiting to see if they'll actually give us the data. There is this independent review committee that is stocked with some really bright people that are very well intentioned, but they're operating secretly. They're not even holding listening sessions. But we understand from the hearing that they have made significant suggestions to the Department of Justice for how they should change the tool. They may be changing it, they may not. The Bureau of Prisons has until mid-January to use the tool to evaluate every prisoner. So what's happening now as we're speaking is that the department is considering what sounds like some pretty significant input from this independent review committee. They're considering whatever our ability has been to provide feedback and raise questions and concerns, and they're tweaking the tool. We don't know what they're doing with it. Um, and we don't actually know whether we'll ever see the tool itself. The BOP knows they can't wait because they've got to evaluate everybody, so they're already training their people on how to use the tool as it's written, even though they're not done writing it. So the, what, what's so concerning is the secrecy of it all. And there doesn't seem to be a compelling need for it to be that secret. Um, and um, of course, on the need side, it's completely absent. There's literally nothing in the report about how we're going to evaluate prisoners for their needs. That part of the statute so far seems to have been ignored. Um, when you look at the tool itself, I will say that it is deeply troubling. Just because the amount of points, if, you're, if, you're, if your age at first conviction is less than 18 years old, it's like a plus 12. And if you, your criminal history may be up to as much as a plus 30. That On the other hand, hand if you're, everything we know about adolescent development. If you're allowed to voluntarily surrender, as my clients are, it's a minus 12. So I'm telling you that going forward, the optics of this are going to be horrific. The young black men are going to stay forever. The rich white guys are going to walk out the door early. And what we've done is changed our philosophy of sentencing without discussing it. We used to sentence people based on what they did. We are now sentencing people based on what we are afraid they might do in the future, all without any discussion. 
So um, I, I, I just think that the moral issues here are huge. Also in your course materials is an incredible letter that Secure's organization submitted about the, the tool. The federal defenders have a very thoughtful comment letter that's also in your materials. Uh, Professor Slobogan's letter, uh, uh, just in his individual capacity, is also in the materials. Um, I think we're going to look back and think, oh my god, what have we done? I mean, it, it's a great idea that we want to let people out early. Don't get me wrong, I mean, the motivation there, we got too many people in prison, let's let some out. Let's have some transparency and some real thought and, and um, virtue around how we go about doing that. And uh, of course, there's no money there in the Bureau of Prisons to even put these needs programs into place, but hopefully that will be coming. Um, but any, anyway, uh, Sandy, I know you had a question or comment. I had a question. Is the tool just for use by the Bureau of Prisons with regard to the sort of good time yes. calculation, or is no. it for other purposes like the compassionate release? No, the compassionate release, there's a combination of things you want to look at there. There's a statute and there's a guideline, and they're not quite the same, and some are broader in some ways, and some are narrow in other ways, and then there are also BOP regulations that you want to look at and define things. It's not just terminally ill people. One of the other examples is if you are the sole caretaker for a minor child as a result of perhaps the death of a spouse while you've been in prison, that's explicitly recognized as an extraordinary and compelling circumstance where you might be allowed to be released to care for that minor child. It's sort of limited only by the imagination in some ways. I mean, there, there are catch-alls in there where any other reason that Judge Thunheim thinks is extraordinary and, and, and compelling. By the way, did they appeal your rule? Uh, no, they didn't. Uh, and it, mine was a 72-year-old 70, guy who had about seven or eight different ailments that were hard to treat, but he wasn't terminal. But there's no reason for him not to be home. Yeah. Am I right, or I've heard that, that uh, age is a big factor, and that if you're over, if you're 70 or over, or 60 and over, uh, it would really substantially, which a lot of our clients are. Exactly. Yeah, that that, that is a big factor here. Well, of course, the flip side of that is you might not even young, really high. Um, so, yes. I mean, that's the problem here, is that this is based on the math. And so, one of the things I feel backed into a corner by is that, the, the gentleman who really, Grant Dewey, a great Minnesotan uh, from the Department of Corrections of Minnesota, the guy who wrote the tool, and he followed the math. But what he's looking at is arrests. And we know that blacks are going to just have a lot more arrests. So we're baking that into a system based on math. So if I want to do something about that, if I want to push back and say, wait a minute, that's not fair. That's going to have a racially disparate impact. I don't have any math. i got to pull it out of my butt to say, wait a minute, don't do that, do this, but based on what? So it's a heck of a challenge uh, and a place that I think we've been sort of backed into, uh, Professor Wiesel. Um What you just said leads into one of two observations I have, and I'm wondering if they were taken into account. When you talk about arrests or priors, that was taken into account in the sentence. So the fact that the person is serving 15 or 20 or 25, it's already taken into account. So if you take it into account for a reduction, you're giving it double weight as compared to what happens while the person is in prison. So it seems to me that a better approach would be if you, uh, uh, the judge wants to uh, grant relief should be to, to a new sentencing hearing where that's only given single weight. The other thing that struck me is that with the percentages, low to moderate to high and so on, that's self-defeating. In an ideal system, you rehabilitate everybody right. so that they all go down to the lowest level, right. but this is inherently saying we can never rehabilitate more than 25%. Or, well, no more than 50%. The other thing that I wonder about down the road is, is what, what will change once people understand this system and have been with it for a while? Will it affect judges' sentencing decisions? Will it affect prosecutors' plea bargaining offers once they realize how this tool works? I think there, there's just a lot here that hasn't shaken out yet. Yes, Judge. Uh, I just wanted to add, I really appreciate this conversation. As a judge for 27 years, sentencing about 600 defendants a year, every kind of felony from shoplifting to murder, the tool is only as good as the people that created the tool and the ones that are implementing the tool. And you can't base it on numbers. Just a basic conviction 
for, let's say, armed robbery. If the person goes into McDonald's with an AK-47 and robs of money from the cash register, it's a totally different thing than someone that holds a windshield wiper up and robs Halloween candy from three kids. In my jurisdiction, which is a tough on crime jurisdiction outside of Detroit, Oakland County, I'm telling you real cases. Charges of armed robbery with a windshield wiper just being held, not beating anyone, and kids with candy. Now, they're both wrong, but if you're going to count them in the tool as exactly the same, you wouldn't expect me to sentence those two people the exact same way. So the devil is in the details of the conviction, the nature of the individual, and so many other factors that I review based on everything in my jurisdiction has compass for about the last two years. I, I really don't pay it that much attention. Well, it's not mandatory, it's not required. I'm looking at that along with the big picture in the 20 page report that I receive from my probation department on every single defendant that I sentence. And, and that goes back to the, the whole issue that algorithms can serve a useful purpose, but they do not handle context well at all. And that's, that's key to keeping in mind uh, that they really, they have a difficult time and the more variables they try to, uh, to accommodate, the less able even the developers of the program will be to explain how the, the uh, tool came to a particular conclusion. Jim, Jim, can I jump in there for a second just on the compass? Yeah, it's killing me. Just because, well, I want to just, I just want to push back a little bit with Jim. When Jim said, I don't have math, this is the, and I hear what he's saying, but I hope people take away, it's math overlaid with subjectivity. Yeah. So it, it disguises it. You think it's evidence and it's science and it's mathematical, and then it's where you put the cut point. Yeah. Let me just give you a very specific example. Again, back to New York. We have this brand new risk assessment coming out numbers, numerical, University of Chicago, millions of dollars, and they determine this is the, this is the percentage who are gonna get released. Then someone realized, but wait a minute, shouldn't we move that a little if it's a certain kind of crime? <laughs> so suddenly certain crime, <laughs> there's no data to support it, it's just, and most people don't even know what happened until you look carefully and go, wait a minute, what did, where did it, so the subjectivity, and very quickly on the compass, Again, I'm, I'm bashing my home state. Here's, here's New York's experience with the compass. So these are parole decisions, critically hard decisions. And the stated purpose was that parole boards were so risk averse that people were doing decades, decades, decades and not getting out. Remarkable evidence of transformation, parole denied. The compass comes in, this risk assessment tool, and the critical decision we all missed was whether to make it advisory, presumptive, or mandatory. So it's just another tool. So what have we now seen after the last couple of years? People charged with violent crime, beautiful compass score, no risk of reoffending. Guess what happens? Denied. Denied. When is the compass followed? When you have a terrible compass score. So these, the, the magic behind these, it, a lot of this is smoke and mirrors. That's my only reaction to the math piece. Yeah, another example, in the in pattern, if you have two serious infractions, you just crank. Yeah. And a serious infraction is a 100 level infraction. So possession of a joint is a 100 level infraction. Killing someone is a 100 level infraction. It's nuts. Again, if there were transparency so that we could all look at it and study it and talk about it together, maybe over the years we could improve it. That's what we really need to push for. So it seems that the tool is designed for the quantity and the quality. In other words, it's trying to get as many people out as possible um, without knowing that what, you know, determine the fact, because as we know, criminal cases in particular are fact intensive. A, a little fact can twist the outcome. So it now comes to the question, how far they try to implement this tool. If this is only at the low level of the persons that you call like correctory officers, not as not many offense. But if only 
in the daily or the very low level of law enforcement that might work to a certain extent. And then if those people are united and the low level, they will be able to come to the upper level where the judges will begin to exercise uh, their judgments on the facts, then the public could work to a certain point. But it's to, if you want to apply that tool to all the labels, then it's really not much. Well, there's no question that it's a lot easier to calculate things that are quantity than quality, and I think you're right. Anyway, well, I, I, I think we're about out of time, so thank you all for staying a little late, and thank you to the <laughs>